the scripture teaches that the Christian life is a warfare. It demands courage. It demands sacrifice. It demands rugged self-discipline. Even the songs we were singing, one of them mentioned, uh, joyful, joyful, we adore thee. You know, going on in the march, being victorious in the fight. Um, we sang, for thy name's sake, give us grace to reach the goal. Um, the Bible, as Brother David, Pastor David shared a few weeks ago, is that uh, the Christian journey is likened unto being a soldier, an athlete, and a farmer. And one of the things about all three of those is they take tremendous stress and training. I, I've watched athletes, and I realize that these athletes, I was in the restaurant yesterday, and there's a great big football screen, big screen, and they were watching the football game, Michigan versus Florida. And uh, every so often they zoom in on one of the players, close-ups. And, and you know what I was impressed with? They are all built like miniature tanks. Just <sighs> muscles bulging everywhere. You know what? You don't get muscles like that without a lot of work. And probably a lot of pills as well. Farmers... Um, they're some of the hardest working people I've ever met. You know, I've been privileged to get to know the Welker family out in Montana where Justin lives and they attend the church there. And Nick was here recently with Kathleen. And if you look at Nick, he looks like a football player, just built like a miniature tank. And his dad, who's close to my age, looks the same. And his brother, they look the same. These guys work incredibly hard to be a farmer. Athletes and soldiers, obviously soldiers go through incredible training to be a soldier. That's what the Lord likens this journey to. Not a picnic in the park. It's a journey of sacrifice, a journey of trials, warfare, demands, self-discipline, courage, and we, would, we have been led to believe by some teachers that that's just not the case. The theology that is presented stresses that we are to avoid all weariness, toil, pain, all difficulty, all shortages, the bitterness of conflict, desperate days, grueling nights of darkness and distress. Those are all ignored and discussed as lacks of faith. But here's what the Lord says in 1st, 2nd Timothy 2, 3. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. In Mark chapter 10, Jesus said unto him, One thing you lack to the rich young ruler. He was rich and he was young. Go thy way and sell whatever you have. Give to the poor and you shall have treasure in heaven and come take up your cross and follow me. He communicated the exact opposite of the theology that is being presented by some. Paul said, forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 14, verse 19 says, Then Jews from Antioch and Iconium came there, and having persuaded the multitudes, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. However, when the disciples gathered around him, he rose up, went into the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derbe. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith, and saying, listen carefully, we must, through much and many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. And that was spoken by a man who had just been stoned and left for dead. We have to have a proper perspective. When you look through history, there is a tremendous army of noble martyrs. Right now, there is a tremendous army of people being martyred around the world. The faith and prosperity teaching, I've said for 50 years, needs to be gone, taken over to places like India and Africa and uh, Uganda and the Congo and preach it there so that it can be exposed as false because it doesn't work. Here, if you are clever enough, you can get people to support you, and it looks successful, but when it comes down to where the rubber meets the road, it doesn't quite work out for the people who are trying to believe the false message. 
When you look at history and study history, for example, the Fox's Book of Martyrs and others, the fact is that those books exalt and glorify the heroic courage, the valor, the commitment, the undeniable uh, uh, sacrifice of the host of disciples throughout Christianity. It's interesting that of the 12 apostles, 11 of them died martyrs. What a contrast to the popular teaching <clears throat> and a contrast to songs and teaching of today. C.T. Studd, a famous minister of the gospel, said, If Jesus be God and died for me, then no sacrifice can be too great for me to make for him. Norman Grubb, another famous author and minister of the gospel, pointed out that the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer will drive him to a life of suffering sacrifice, just as he did in the life of Jesus. We have to ask a question. Is life a life of unbroken peace, joy, prosperity, health, happiness, success, affluence, and is it a life of spiritual superiority to the life of suffering? Which one brings the most glory to God? Are all fallen short who don't enter into this prosperous health, wealth, and prosperity message and healing message? I'm hoping to answer all these questions. One recognizes that miracles and healings are marvelous, and we want them. Even this morning, I prayed for more of the glory of God to be manifested in the church, more of his triumph over sickness and difficulty. In 2 Corinthians 12, 12, the Bible says, Truly the signs of an apostle's were wrought among you in all patience and signs and wonders and mighty deeds. I don't know about you, but I'm looking for more signs and wonders and mighty deeds. But are the ones who have suffered martyrdom such as the millions in Russia and the millions in China and the millions in Korea and the millions around the world in Muslim countries, are they second-rate Christians because they didn't experience deliverance? Are we supposed to just give up and wallow in self-pity? Are all the ones who are not healed and delivered from difficult financial situations second-class citizens in the kingdom of God, as some would teach? How many of you know that most are not healed? And, of course, it's immediately declared it's because they didn't have any faith. I've seen people suffering intently, dying of sicknesses. We had a man in this church years ago. He had uh, Parkinson's. And every time there was an altar service for praying for healing, he would sit near the back and he would get up out of his seat and he would drag his body to the front and he would pull along his leg and make it almost a spectacle of getting down to the front for healing, whether it was the pastor or the evangelist or whoever was preaching healing. And we had some really powerful evangelists declaring great healing for everybody. And that man would drag himself down to the altar, and he would drag himself back to his seat. And then people would say he didn't have any faith. You know what I felt like doing as a young man? Smacking him. I watched him do that over and over and over. And I've seen so many people seeking with all their heart to be healed, trying to believe with all their heart, only to see them pass away. Some of them are the mates of people in this room right now, suffering for years. Others with children who've suffered for years, and they never saw the healing they were hoping for. But we have a promise, and we heard about it earlier. When Jesus comes, all corruption, all mortality, all sickness, all pain, all suffering is going to end in an instant in the blink of an eye. 
And every single promise in the Bible will be fulfilled in every single one of us. There will be no more pain, sorrow, suffering, sickness, lack in the kingdom. Jesus said he heals all our diseases. How many people who love the Lord and have loved the Lord that you know died from their sicknesses? How many people know people that were Christians and loved the Lord and died from their sicknesses? And yet the Lord says in his own word, he heals all our diseases. The problem is we want it done now. And he says, I'm going to do it in a moment, in the twinkling or the blink of an eye, and your mortality is putting on immortality, your corruption, incorruption, and it's going to all end. And that promise will be fulfilled in the blink of an eye. And we also know that when he comes back, he's going to bring all the souls of all the saints who have ever died with him, all the martyrs, all the ones who have died from sicknesses, all those who have suffered intently, He's going to bring all their spirits with him. And the first thing he does is raises their bodies from the dead, gives them new bodies. He transforms our sickly, poor, wretched bodies into brand new, incorruptible, immortal bodies. And together we will rise to meet him in the air and escort him back to earth to establish a perfect kingdom. Kingdom, What a day that's going to be. It's no wonder the Lord said, cry and pray out, thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And that prayer will be answered. But not necessarily right now. Turn with me in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I was talking to my friend George at his restaurant yesterday morning for breakfast. He's Albanian. And he gave me the name of the country that was that Albania became when Paul was on the earth. And Paul literally went to Albania and preached the gospel there. It wasn't called Albania. I forget if he said Lystra or Iconium. I don't know, maybe you'll know, but it was the one right there on the corner of the sea. Paul went there and preached the gospel to that country. In fact, how many of you have heard of the name St. Nicholas? Well, St. Nicholas was a real man. He was an Albanian who literally gave away food and clothes and gifts to people and ministered the gospel in 270 AD. And that Man's godly life has been reduced by the world to Santa Claus. There are a bunch of Santa Clauses that did it because he was a great man. But Paul preached the gospel in those countries. And here's what Paul says, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, starting in verse 5. 2 Corinthians 4, starting in verse 5. And I would like you to all turn there so you can read because we're going to read a pretty decent section here. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, starting in verse 5. We do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servant for Jesus' sake. For it is God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. The literal Greek there means clay pots. And a comparable interpretation or translation for us today would be we have this treasure in styrofoam cups. That's about what a clay pot was. It was the cheapest possible cup or container you could have in the days that Paul was writing this. He says, but we have this treasure in earthen clay pots that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. Listen to Paul's testimony. We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be made manifest in our body. How many of you want the life of Jesus to be made manifest in your body? I do. But notice what it's going to take. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be made manifest in our mortal flesh. 
If we're going to manifest the Lord, it's going to take some real dealings, real fixes. I remember what Bob Mumford said years ago. If God fixes a fix to fix you and you fix the fix that God fixed to fix you, he'll just fix it all over again. And that's the truth, and I've learned it to be the truth. He says, so then death is working in us, but life in you. But since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believe that therefore I spoke, we also believe, and therefore speak. Knowing that he who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus and will present us with you. Notice his perspective. It is on the end, the resurrection. For all things are for your sakes, that grace having spread through the many may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart. You don't lose heart if everything is health, wealthy, if you're, everything that you have is healthy, wealthy, and wise. It's like you just bound on in glory. But Paul says, therefore, we don't lose heart, having suffered all the things he just mentioned. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. In other words, Christ is being formed in us, even though our flesh is suffering. Are you following what Paul's saying here? Notice this next phrase. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Our light affliction. <laughs> Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I want to read, I mean, we just read chapter 4. Let's go a few chapters later in Paul's letter to the Corinthians and read his light afflictions. I say that we were too weak for that, but in whatever anyone is bold, I speak foolishly, I am bold also. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequently, in deaths often. And then he begins to list his light afflictions. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes, save one. You know why they gave 40 minus one? Because they were afraid that if they gave him 40, it would kill him. And when you consider the fact what that stripes meant, they had a whip with three strands of leather, and on the end was three pieces of bone or lead woven into the leather, and when they would strike the person on the back, the beads or the bone would embed in the back, and then they would scrape it down and rip open their backs. That's why he said, I bear in my body the marks for the cause of Christ. His back had been ripped up, and this happened to him five times. Five times. And let me say to you that I believe the Apostle Paul was the greatest of all the apostles. In my mind, it's unquestionably the way it was. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I've been in the deep. And let me tell you, there's sharks in those waters. In journeys often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, beside the other things what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches, who is weak and I am not weak, who is made to stumble and I do not burn with indignation, if I must boast, I will boast in the things which concern my infirmity. The God of our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who is blessed forever, knows that I am not lying. In Damascus, the governor under Artis, the king, was guarding the city of Damascus scenes with a garrison desiring to apprehend me, but I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and escaped from his hands. 
That's what he called light afflictions. Why? Because he was clearly saying it's going to work in him a far more exceeding eternal weight of glory. Paul's eye was not on the now. Do you think he's sorry now he went through any of this? Paul's not sorry. He's one of the heroes near the throne. Let's continue reading his letter. It is doubtless, by the way, I'm going, to tell, I'm going to show you what Paul's infirmity in the flesh was. How many of you have wondered what Paul's infirmity in the flesh was? I'm going to show you right now. It's as clear as can be in this text, and I just can't believe no one seems to see it. Well, there's people who see it, but not very many. They get all taken up with, he had a sickness, he was blind, he could hardly see. It's not what he's saying. I'll show you that in a second. It is doubtless not profitable for me to boast. I'm come to visions and revelations of the Lord. <laughs> now he's going to talk about what God showed him. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know or whether out of the body I do not know. God knows such a man was cut up to the third heaven. He's speaking of himself. Every Bible teacher believes that. I know such a man. He didn't know whether he was in the body or out of the body. I don't know. God knows. He, he wasn't sure he was there physically or in the spirit, but he knew he was there. How he was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words, listen, which is not lawful for a man to utter. He couldn't even tell anybody what he learned. Now that's a trial. How many of you could have a vision of heaven and never tell anybody what you saw? Um, that would be beyond my capacity. I'd have to tell somebody. But Paul had grown in such tremendous character that he could keep it quiet. And also, also the apostle John, remember he heard the seven thunders utter their voice and the Lord said, don't write what they, they uttered. John knew what they uttered, but he wasn't allowed to tell us. These men had revelations that they weren't allowed to tell. That's amazing to me. Of such a one I will boast, yet of myself I will not boast, except, listen, I will boast in my infirmities. Go back to verse 30. If I must boast, I will boast in the things which concern my infirmity. And he had just listed his infirmities. What he had gone through. <clears throat> and that word infirmity means weakness. He said, so if I'm going to boast... I will boast in my infirmities. And he had just told us that he was boasting in his infirmities. And the infirmities were the persecution he faced. For though I might have desired to boast, I will not be a fool, for I will speak the truth. But I forbear, lest anyone should think of me above what he sees me to be or hears from me. And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will boast in my infirmities. Three times he refers to boasting in his infirmities, and the infirmities he listed is the ones right above the first time he said he would boast in his infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities. He used the same word over and over and over, and he says, I'm boasting about them. And the infirmities was the persecution he was constantly facing to preach the gospel. It wasn't physical sickness. That's the infirmities. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches in needs. Notice he's summarizing what those infirmities were. I take pleasure in infirmities in, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. He doesn't mention I'm sick. His infirmities that he mentions are, as he reviews them, reproaches, persecutions, needs, and distresses for Christ's sake, which is the fourth time he's used the word infirmities in the context. What Paul was suffering was the attack of the enemy, who in Thessalonians he said, Satan hath hindered me. He was being attacked and suffering tremendous persecution for the cause of Christ. 
Paul's late afflictions, what a list. Many of those afflictions caused physical pain and suffering, possibly permanent injury. The word afflictions in the scripture can refer, refer to sicknesses, but in this context, not once does he mention sicknesses. It's all the persecutions. Some would say we should never accept physical illness as discipline from the Lord. How many of you have heard that? Never accept physical sickness as a discipline from the Lord. Anybody ever hear that before? How many of you understand? How many of you could give me a scripture that proves that's false? Here's one. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and the drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many among you are weak and sick and a number have died. But if we judge ourselves, we would not be come under judgment. We are judged by the Lord. We are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned with the world. He is saying that when people take communion improperly and they become weak or sickly and even die, it is the discipline of the Lord so they don't end up in judgment at the end. God clearly uses physical illness to discipline his children. Alexander McLaren has said that every affliction comes with a message from the heart of God. Watchman Nee has said, who suffered intently in Chinese prisons, we will never learn anything new about God except by adversity. Many, many years ago, I was in the middle of some very, very, this was before I was pastoring here, very, very difficult situations. And I was reading Psalm 119, and three verses just came off the page, and I never memorized them. I just knew them from that day on. And here they are. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I obey your word. It was good for me to be afflicted so that I might learn your decrees. I know, O Lord, that your laws are righteous, and in faithfulness you have afflicted me. They so arrested me, I wrote a song. You want to hear it? <laughs> it's not real impressive. But it goes something like this. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now have I kept thy word. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now have I kept thy word. It is good for me that I have been afflicted. It is good for me that I have been afflicted. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now have I kept thy word. That's never gone over as a chorus here at Calvary. <laughs> not quite as good as the ones my sweet wife wrote as we sang today, you know, for thy name's sake, raise us up, give us the victory. Why would she sing that? Because in the midst of trial, she was saying, Lord, for thy name's sake, give us the victory. You don't sing songs like that without being in a trial. You don't sing those kind of phrases without needing grace to go through what you're going through. Paul said, our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. But for a moment. That word works is translated by some scholars to mean creates. Creates. For our light affliction is but for a moment, but it creates for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. What Paul is trying to tell us is that our afflictions, what he called light afflictions, if properly accepted, is actually creating and producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond our proportion, the, the proportion of our pain and suffering. Let me assure you of something. When God sends us difficulties, we can either cherish it as God's lovingly, lovingly preparing us for his positions for us as his bride, 
or we can rebel against it, resist it, rebuke it, and try to cast the demons out. I'm going to tell you some stories. This is something I have observed. I'm going to be 69 in three weeks. Biblically, that's 70, by the way. When they passed their 69th birthday, they were called 70. That's why Jesus began to be 30 years old. What that meant was he passed his 29th birthday and was starting his 30th year when he began his ministry. I've learned some things on the journey, and I've been on the journey running after the Lord my whole life. I got saved at four, at 15 was called to the ministry, and I have been pursuing the Lord throughout that time, walking with a lot of really fine ministries. In my own family, of six of us children, four of us boys became pastors, and my sister became a missionary to Japan. I've been surrounded by some of the finest ministers in the United States through the Charismatic Renewal, Judson Cornwall, um, Bob Mumford, some others. That has affected my life. And I've just watched and I've seen things. Let me just give you a little statement first before I give you these stories. How many of you know that our friend Jacob in the Old Testament was a rascal? His name Jacob means deceiver, surplanter, liar. And you watch Jacob and you see his story, and I can't go through his story for time's sake, but when you see Jacob, he flees after deceiving his brother, goes to his uncle Laban's house, and for the next Seven years, he serves for Rachel, only to wake up to find out it wasn't Rachel, it was Leah, after he was given her as his wife. Now, I, I really don't know how that works. <laughs> I've never figured that one out. <laughs> they, they must have done things a whole lot different back then than we do now. But he didn't know it was Leah till the morning. And lo, it was Leah. <laughs> oh, what a shock that had to be. But how many of you recognize that, and lo, it was Jacob and not Esau? He just reaped what he sowed. And then the Bible makes it clear that he served seven more years for Rachel. And my opinion is that she was given to him the same time Leah was right afterwards because they list all the children that were being born to Leah over those next years. And Rachel is all grieving because she isn't having any children. And yet she's the husband of Jacob. So I think that Laban probably said, okay, I promised you, Rachel, you can have Rachel too, but you're going to serve seven more years. And so Jacob did. So now he's there for 14 years. Then he spends six more years to get the flocks. So if you consider that, he spent 20 years in Laban's house. What? <laughs> What a trial that had to be for Jacob. And he says to him later, you've changed my wages 10 times. <laughs> I mean, I don't know about you, but if somebody changed my wages once after they made a commitment, I'd want to wring their neck. But he says, you've done it 10 times. God bless me. And if it wasn't for God, I'd be broke. But God bless me in spite of you, Laban. So they separate ways. 20 years. And he's on his way back, and now Esau's on his way to get him, to greet him. I don't know if you've ever noticed that when he came to greet him, he was with 400 men. Jacob got the report that Laban was on his way with 400 men. He thought his life was over. So he sends all his family and all his kids and all his wives over across the river, and he stays there, and the Lord meets him. And the Lord wrestles with him and hits him in the hollow of his thigh. And for the rest of Jacob's life, he limped. And how many of you know that night God says, by the way, your name is no longer crooked, thieving, deceiving, lying, supplanter. You are to call yourself Israel, the Prince of God. 
which in Isaiah 49, I've told you this before, Israel is one of the names of Jesus. He gave him one of his names. And Jesus and, and Jacob suffered for the rest of his life, limping around. And yet at the end of his life, God says of Jacob, I am the God of Jacob. I'm not sure I'd claim to be the God of Jacob. But God decided he had changed Jacob so much he could say, I'm the God of Jacob. As freely and gladly as he said, I'm the God of Abraham. I'm the God of Isaac. And I'm the God of Jacob. He was changed. But it was at the very end of his life. Here's what I've seen. I've seen people who resist the dealings of God, the fixes of God, the workings of God in their lives, and they resist it, they rebel against it, they won't listen to counsel, and they get to be old, and they're, they're Christians. And they're getting ready to go to heaven, and they're not ready. I'm going to give you four cases. One was a man in this church. Everybody in this church loved him. In fact, I'm pastor here because he made sure when my father-in-law resigned as the head elder of the church at the time that everything moved towards getting me here. He was the one God used. Brother Gross was his name. How many of you were around when Brother Gross was around? How many of you loved Brother Gross? Brother Gross. All the kids loved him. I loved him. He loved me. Wonderful, wonderful man. But Brother Gross had a son-in-law. His son-in-law was six foot six, big old guy. And Brother Gross was an iron worker that built buildings downtown. And he was the supervisor that built buildings like the Penobscot building downtown. He was a rugged, big big barreled chested German guy. He made me look kind of small. That's really going to get you, Brother Dave. <laughs> if you stood next to Brother Gross, you'd think you're next to a mountain. But his son-in-law dwarfed him. But his son-in-law was a salesman. He was a salesman. <laughs> He didn't know how to work in Brother Gross's mind. So Brother Gross gave him a name. Meathead. He called him that to his face at family of gatherings. Hey, Meathead, how would you like to be called Meathead by your father-in-law your whole life? Well, Brother Gross Love me, serve the Lord. God, he was serving the Lord and he was a good man. But he got cancer and he began to deteriorate. And the Lord spoke to me to go talk to Brother Gross. And I said, Brother Gross, you cannot go to heaven until you repent to your son-in-law, Ronnie. He looked down. I know. I said, well, you repent to him. You get him in here and you repent to him. So he did. He submitted to me and he obeyed what I told him to do. He called Ronnie in, asked him to forgive him for calling him meathead his whole life. His life continued to deteriorate. Ronnie had lost his job and he was not working. And so he was able to be with his mother-in-law to work with and maintain and help her with Brother Gross. And one day as Ronnie was there, Brother Gross had kind of slipped down in the bed. He didn't have the strength to even put himself up on the pillow. Ronnie being this big, massive guy, and Brother Gross had deteriorated to a small man. Well, he wasn't a small man. His chest was a big barrel, but there wasn't much meat on it anymore. And Ronnie reaches down, and he picks Brother Gross up, and he slides him forward and lays him on the pillow. And while Ronnie was holding Brother Gross, 
he died in his arms. And he laid him down. My wife's grandmother was a pistol. Not the one in Illinois, the one that lived in Detroit. She was a little Italian that came over from Italy. Never really got the language very well. She had four children, two, two sons, two daughters. The one daughter lived, she lived with, the other daughter lived next door. The one son was her pastor and my, my father-in-law broke away from her controlling spirit because of my mother-in-law. She couldn't take it. The other wives all submitted to grandma like she was the, the matriarch of the family. I never really liked grandma. I put up with her, kept my mouth shut, didn't rebuke her, visited her as little as I could. And my wife didn't enjoy going over to be with her because she saw what she was. She was constantly just yapping at the mouth and causing trouble, just the way she was. One day she had a stroke. She was put in the hospital and for four years she laid in a bed, couldn't eat and couldn't talk. And all she could say was, mamma, 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 mamma mia, mamma, 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 mamma mia. And we'd go visit her. And every time we'd walk in, she would be happy to see us. Mamma, 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 mamma mia, mamma, mamma, mamma mia. She never said another word for four years. And God took her home. Why did God allow that? Because grandma needed to be shut up and dealt with. Are you listening to me? My own father was a very hard man. He was a good man, a godly man, committed to the authority of scripture, raised six children, all Christians, five of us became ministry. Not in the same denomination he raised us in, but he joined the denomination we were in. He became a Pentecostal. And he was a good man, but he was very, very harsh. My dad didn't talk, he yelled. When he'd call me, or Jay, he'd be down in the basement, Mark, Jay! We'd come running. He got Alzheimer's, and he began to deteriorate. Pretty soon, my mother and my sister are taking care of him, and they came to visit me when I was pastoring in northern New York, and one day my dad walked up to me, and he leaned over by this. He was only five foot eight at his tallest. And um, by the time he was done shrinking, I, he was, I doubt he was more than about five foot two or three. Just a real small man. And he walked up to me. And he leaned forward like this. Shuffled up to me. Put his head against my chest. And just stood there. Just a soft, gentle man. And I grabbed him and I held him and I rubbed his back. A broken, gentle man. And then he died. My mother was a wonderful woman, but my mother didn't like submitting to her husband. She didn't rebel against him openly, but she would not obey him when it came to the spiritual realm and he knew it and she was more committed to her father's false religion than she was to my dad's true faith. My mother was born again but she believed things that were really off. My dad died and she was a widow for quite a few years, I think 15. And one day she said to me, she had been visiting, they had a picnic on the family farm in the very house where she was born. And she was 80 years old and it started to rain and my cousin, really loving guy, he grabbed her and kind of got on one side and another cousin the other side, and they, escorting her down the hill out of the field where the picnic was and kind of walked a little bit too fast. And when they did, four of her vertebrae in the back of her back were so 
week from osteoporosis, they collapsed. And she came into intense pain. It was the spring of the 19, or spring of her 80th year. She couldn't, my mother was always a servant, served all the ladies in the church. She was a deaconess in her church. And their church believed in salvation. They just had some really squirrely ideas, but I don't want to go into that. But she couldn't serve anybody. Now she's being served. Two of her sisters moved her into the apartment house where she was in, where they lived, and they were there taking care of her. She couldn't take a shower without their help. She couldn't do anything without their help. And I went down to visit her because she wanted to sign some legal papers of a will and, and um, a living will that she didn't want kept alive in certain if, if she needed medical attention to keep her alive, they didn't, she didn't want it. And so she turns to me, and as I'm getting ready to leave to come back home here, she said to me, honey, is it okay for me to ask the Lord to take me home? And I said, sure, just ask him. She said, I can't serve anybody. I'm in incredible pain. And by this time, it had been six months of incredible pain. I left and came home, and by the time I got home, a phone call came the next morning. She had had a stroke after praying that the Lord would take her home. And she ended up in a coma, semi-coma, for 35 days and ended her life on a 35-day fast. Ready for heaven. Dealt with because she wouldn't let God deal with those things when she was alive and had normal life. Do you want to get to the end of your life and not have things dealt with so God has to deal with you in a very difficult way to make you ready for your eternal purpose? Or are you willing to suffer now with the perspective that it is a light affliction that is working in you a far more eternal weight of glory? What do you want? If God is a merciful, loving, heavenly Father, he's not going to let you or me end our lives without dealing with us. That's why he says in the book of Hebrews, despise thou not the chastening of the Lord, nor be weary of his correction. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, even the son in whom he delights. And even though it's not joyous for the time, it works in us a far more exceeding eternal weight of glory. Where is your perspective? If it's here and now, blessing and health and wealth and prosperity, you reject all of that discipline. But if your vision is eternal, you say, thank you, Lord. As hard as this has been, thank you, Lord. And there's going to be a day you will walk up to the Lord and say, thank you, Lord. I was in a meeting where Johnny Erickson was speaking. Johnny Erickson, Erickson Tata, which, as you know, dove into the lake when she was 17 and broke her neck and has been in a wheelchair ever since. She became an extremely godly woman, has spoken all over the world and written books and is an amazing woman. I've been blessed by her life and testimony and ministry on numbers of occasions. And she was sitting in this auditorium I was at about 20 years ago, not quite 20, probably 15 years ago. She was speaking, and she's my age, same age as I am. And this happened when she was 17. And she's sitting in her wheelchair, and she can throw her arm up over the back. It's about all she can do. She, she can't feed herself without help. And she said, I've been in this wheelchair a very long time. And I'm looking forward to getting rid of this wheelchair. But I have asked the Lord if he would be willing to take my wheelchair to heaven so I can walk up to him in heaven and point to my wheelchair and say, thank you, Lord, for putting me in that wheelchair because it's made me the woman I am. She has blessed, multiplied millions with her testimony in life. That's not despising the chastening of the Lord. That's embracing it. 
Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel, wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer even unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound. Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. It's amazing how he constantly refers to eternal, eternal, eternal. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. You want to reign with Christ? Embrace suffering. I don't know what this year is going to bring. And as far as I'm concerned, this world is going out of control. If you don't see that, you have your head in the sand. Even the ungodly are saying, I don't know what's happening. I know what's happening. The end is upon us. The purpose of this earth, and this is my final thought, the purpose of this earth and our time here is to prepare a bride for Jesus Christ. That's his purpose. To be co-regent of the universe with him forever. In fact, the Bible says, now we are the sons of God and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but when he shall appear, we shall see him as we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. We don't have any idea what is a future of our lives eternally. All I know is that the almighty, incredibly infinite, wonderful, loving father is the one preparing it for us. And the only place he can get us ready to be what he's going to use us to be as the bride of Christ is now. And it isn't going to be because we had health, wealth, and prosperity. It's going to be because he fixed, fixes to fix us. If we're going to be on the throne next to him, we have to accept the suffering of this trip present time, as Paul made it very clear. This is the only opportunity we will have to develop in the crucible of suffering. No one becomes a saint without suffering because suffering proper, properly accepted is the pathway to his eternal glory. Oh, this is not some great message of making you feel good today. But if you're facing suffering right now, or you face suffering this year, or we face suffering over the next number of years, which we have no idea what we're going to face, we do not know. All I know is that the Bible doesn't paint a real pretty picture of the last three and a half years of world situation. But I know this. Trouble comes to sinners and saints alike. And how we accept it determines its value. No man, it, all men are born to trouble as the sparks fly upward. And the only good out of suffering is it conforms us to Christ. And when Paul says, all things work together for good to those who love God and are the called according to his purpose, that's not just a nice little poetic statement. All things. He was making a declaration. Everything you will ever face will produce the character of Christ if you handle it the right way. It will work good but you may not see the good until you breathe your last breath. I often think of my wife. In fact, I think of her every day. Every single day. When I make my bed every day. And I make my bed every day. And when I do... I think of her because she made her bed every day. And I made up my mind, I'll make my bed every day in honor of Sharon. So when I make my bed, all I can see is my sweet wife making our bed, and I make it in honor of her. When I'm folding my underwear, I fold it just like she did, and I stack it neatly in my drawer. I don't just stuff it in, which is the way I would normally do it, but I fold it neatly because that's what she did. And I thank the Lord that she's home. 
free from all suffering, all sorrow, all pain. Her journey was over. But you know what she said to me two weeks before she died? We were sitting in the morning having coffee. Obviously, I had no idea Sharon was going to go home to be with the Lord. She turned to me and she said, and I put her, following me through the will of God it was a very difficult time. And, and I can tell you story after story where she just humbled herself and, and accepted the situation. One day a rat came running right over her feet in the parsonage in northern New York. Oh, there's a rat. It's like, that's the way it is around here, honey. <laughs> and I can go on and on about that. She turned to me two weeks before she died and she said, Honey, I'm the woman I have become because I married you. Let me tell you something. When we are ready to marry the bridegroom, it will only be cause of what he chose to put us through in this life. And you can fight it, you can reject it, you can claim it, you can, you can rebuke it, you can do all you want. But in the end, if you embrace the disciplines of the Lord, the sufferings are not constant, it's not every day, but there are times of severe dealings. And if you will lay hold of them, embrace them and say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Do you think you would have heard of Corey Tin Boom if she hadn't been in a concentration camp? And the list goes on and on. Where do you want to be a million years from now? Where do you want to be a hundred years from now? I want to be in the very best place he can get me to. Don't you? Let's stand. For thy name's sake, raise us up. For thy name's sake, make us whole. For thy name's face the future with no certainty of what that holds. Give us the right perspective. Give us a new perspective. One where we realize that all things that you choose for us work together for good. And the good is that it will conform us to the image of Jesus Christ. Your desire for us is to give us an abundant entrance into our heavenly home. Your desire for us is to give us the very best place possible in our eternal standing and home. You're preparing us to be your bride. Lord, may we not kick at the pricks. May we not resist your dealings. May we embrace your fixes so that we might stand for your glory in that hour. Give us the new perspective of eternity 
In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.